Okay. Uh, hi. Good morning, everyone. I'm very glad to see all of you here. Uh, I hope you had a good evening. And um, we'll start right away with Dr. Sam Throp from the National Library. Please. Thanks very much, Roe. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to open the first session of uh, what has already proved to be a very fascinating and productive conference. Uh, <coughs> if you can't hear me, just let me know, but I think we're OK. So I want to talk today about the characterization of demons in two Zoroastrian texts, both written in Middle Persian and both dated to the 9th century. One is the Bundahishan. Uh, which you can see it written out here, a Zoroastrian cosmology and cosmography that contains one of the most important accounts of the myth of creation. The other is the Shkand Gumanic Vizar. Uh, the name of this text, the title, means the doubt-breaking treatise, and it's a rationalist, theological, and polemical work written in the style of the Islamic Ilm al-Kalam by the otherwise unknown author, Mardon Farukh Yormaz Dadan. The Bundahishan is rife with demons. Uh, here's an illustration of what rife with demons might look like. Uh, in the opening chapters of the text, which describe in detail the origins of the world in, and time and the struggle between the good creator god Ormazd and his antagonist, the evil spirit, uh, Ahriman, we learn how Ahriman created legions of demons, many of whom have ind individual names and functions to attack and spoil Orma's perfectly created world. The Bundahishan tells us that this world, though inherently good, is a trap set to catch the demonic forces and to imprison them within the bounds of the sky so that their pollution does not spread to the spiritual realm. Demonic activity, though, is not limited to the era of creation. In the cosmographic chapters that make up the bulk of the work, the Bundahishan describes how demons disrupt the beneficent rain cause disease, bring death, cause earthquakes and whirlwinds, and other damage. Chapter 27 of the Bundeshin, uh, which I will return to in a moment, uh, and the chapter is titled Achiman and the Demon's Evil Deeds, is focused on this demonic activity. Now, the Shkan Gumanic Vizar, in contrast, okay, has almost no demons. Achiman, the evil spirit, is certainly a prominent figure. One of the main goals of the Shkand as I'll refer to it from now on, is to resolve what the author sees as theological contradictions and inconsistencies in the story of creation. On the whole, the Shkand aims to reestablish Zoroastrian theology on a solidly rationalist basis. Beyond that, however, the text hardly refers to named demons, or really to any of the Iranian myths and epic traditions that find expression in other Zoroastrian texts, and a little later in the Shah Nameh. The one exception is in the Shkans chapter on astrology and astronomy, where the planets, considered evil in the Zoroastrian conception, and the demon drought and a few others are mentioned by name. It's as if Mardon Farukh, the author of the Shkand, has swept the stage clean. Now, I think we can sharpen the contrast between these two texts by considering a single, actually quite minor, demon. Chapter 27 of the Bundeshin, uh, which I mentioned a moment ago, contains a list of named demons and their evil deeds. Like much of the rest of the work's cosmographic chapters, this list is written in no clear order and has no narrative frame. We simply find demons' names, their activities, and in some cases, a scriptural proof text or a bit more information. Uh, the treatment of the demons in this chapter is much less expansive than the long descriptions of good spirits given in the immediately preceding section of the foundation. The following passage can serve as an example. Okay, uh, So we read, the demon Tariz mixes poison into the created plants, as it says, Tariz the thrasher and Zarir the venom maker. These six, and this refers to demons who were mentioned immediately previously, uh, including Tariz and uh, Zarir, are called the chief demons. The others are their collaborators and comrades. It also says this, Whomever gives a gift to a man who says one should wear just one shoe and who, has then, uh, and who has taken walking with one shoe as his creed pleases thereby the demon Therese. Now, we don't really know 
what this we don't really know what this last section of the passage refers to, some kind of uh, uh, heresy, some kind of cult. It's not explained, and I don't think we know from other sources about a, a religious tradition where people walk around only with one shoe. So the proof texts here, as elsewhere, are taken from the den. Uh, the den, den is a multivalent concept that can indicate either the Zoroastrian religion as a whole uh, or an aspect of the soul, as well as sacred scripture in its widest sense. Not just the hymns, prayers, and legal texts that make up the Avesta, but also the commentaries on it, and in a sense, the whole sacred tradition. So after listing 35 named demons and their deeds, more or less laconically, chapter 27 turns to other topics, the evil planets and the location of hell. These final passages appear to be later additions to an earlier list, uh, but this could well be an illusion. Many of the chapters of the Bondation are similarly associative, which may relate to the text's presumed oral background. Now, the demon I particularly want to mention is called in Middle Persian mihocht, which means falsehood. And according to six, verse 16 of the chapter, falsehood is the demon of doubt. I mention the demon of doubt because this demon's absence in the Shkand is particularly striking. For the Shkand is a work that is entirely motivated by doubt. As Mardan Fruch tells us explicitly in a brief biographical passage in chapter 10 of the Shkand, in order to know God, I have been an inquirer in every place, investigating his den and will with a fervent mind. So too, in the name of investigation, I've gone out of the country to the land of the Hindus and to many sorts of men. For I did not like that den, which was mine by inheritance, but rather wanted that which was more reliable and more acceptable by wisdom and proof. And I went to the company of men of many different sorts until once when I escaped the profound depths of obscurity and the doubts of the evil explanations, thanks to the beneficence of the gods and the strength, grace, and power of the den. From the very power of the knowledge of the den, and from attentive writings of the sages, and the incomparable writings of the wise Adar Padyavand, and for the writings of the blessed Roshan, son of Adar Farobag, which is named Roshan Niwe, and that also of the great, wise, and righteous Adar Farobag, son of Farokhzad, leader of those of the good religion. The book, which explains the den, and is named Den Kart. Oh, sorry, <coughs> forgetting to do that. Uh, the book, which is, uh, explicates the den and is named Denkard, has saved me from many doubts, errors, and deceit, and from the evil of the sectarians. So what Mardon Farouk is providing us in this passage, uh, we might say, is with a confession in the Augustinian sense, a confession of his own doubt, of his dissatisfaction with the religion in which he was raised, and of the spiritual search that leads him eventually back to faith from doubts, errors, and deceit. Now, Augustine was famously converted by the word. He tells us in his confessions that he heard a child's voice say, tole, lege, take up and read, and then opened the Bible at random to the passage from Romans 13 that commands us to, quote, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the desires of the flesh. So too, Mardan Farouk's return to faith is accomplished by literature, in particular by reading the Denkart, a voluminous Zoroastrian theological encyclopedia also dated to the ninth century. Uh, Professor Shukade quoted from the sixth book of the Denkart yesterday in his lecture. In addition to the Denkart, he also mentions books by uh, the authors Adar P. Vandan and Roshan. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have these books, or uh, perhaps we don't know which existing texts were ascribed to these authors. As he says elsewhere in the Shkand, Mardon Farouk's goal is to provide young Zoroastrian initiates with a spiritual guide that will save them the long journeys and spiritual trials that he himself suffered. In addition to ten, ten chapters devoted to Zoroastrian theology, the second half of the Shkan engages in polemic with Islam, Judaism, Christianity, and Manichaeism. Throughout, Mardon Farouk asks hard questions of his own and others' faiths in order to stave off and answer any doubts that might, might arise concerning the ontology of and relations between Ormazd and Ahriman. This is the reason why 
he devoted so much energy to rationally solving seeming contradictions in the creation story. All this leads, I think, to an obvious question. If doubt is so important in the Shkan Gumani Vizar, why does the demon of doubt never make an appearance there? So I've titled this paper, The Demon Doubt, but it could just as well be called The Case of the Missing Demon. So in order to answer this question, I think we have to return to the story of creation and to how the two texts relate this central myth. In the Bundahishan, one of scholars' main sources for Zoroastrian cosmology, we are told in detail how Ahriman, in the spiritual world, first becomes aware of Orma's good realm, how he tries to attack and conquer it but fails, and how Ormaz and Ahriman come to an agreement to limit their battle in time and space. They agree to fight for 9,000 years and to set the created world as the arena for their contest. We learn how, because of his omniscience, Ormaz knows that the good will ultimately triumph at the end of this period, in the end of days, while Ahriman, because of his stupidity, has no idea that he's being tricked. When his ultimate defeat is revealed to him, Ahriman is stunned, but continues to fight on nonetheless, launching his ill-created demons against Orma's still perfect world. This assault causes the world to move, trapping Ahriman and the demons inside. Now, the aspect of the Bundeshan's account that I want to emphasize is the, its depiction of Ah Ormazd and Ahriman. Both uh, as well as their good and evil minions, are presented as rounded, personified characters. I don't mean by this that Ormazd and Ahriman are equal, not by any means. The absolute difference between them is revealed in the first verses of the first chapter of the Pontahitian. So we see, it is revealed thus in the good Dane, Ormazd was on high, in omniscience and goodness, for infinity in the light. That light is the throne and space of Ormazd. Some call it endless light. And Ormaz's omniscience and goodness were in existence for infinity, just like Ormaz, his throne, the Dane, and time. Ahriman was in darkness, in afterthought, and in aggression down deep. Aggression was his nature and darkness his throne. Some call it endless darkness. The two beings' natures are entirely opposed, but in terms of their depiction, they're equivalent. Just like Ormaz, the Bundeshan depicts Ahriman uh, not in this passage so much, but elsewhere, as thinking, speaking, moving, deliberating, feeling, etc. As they are, the two characters could be lifted from this text and planted in any other story. They are realistic, personified, anthropomorphic fictions. I should also be clear that I don't mean by this that the Bundahishan's account of creation is not theology. Uh, just from reading the first chapter, it's evident uh, that the author is weaving together uh, the creation story with meditations on time, the chain of being, divine substance, etc. Rather, uh, the point I want to make is that the Bundeshan's theology is based on a retelling of, and we might even say a midrash on, myths that portray Ormaz and Ahriman and other demons and good spirits as rounded characters. Though the laconic list in chapter 27 of the Bundeshan is not the best place in the text, uh, perhaps, to look for examples of this kind of full-bodied characterization, it can be found even there. For example, uh, we read the following on the demon greed. Okay. Uh, the demon greed devours everything. When, because of scarcity, nothing else can be found, he consumes his own body. Even when he is given all the wealth in the world, this demon puts nothing aside and is never sated. As it says, the greedy eye is a limitless frontier. Uh, there's also this passage on the demon Indar. The demon Indar's duty is to freeze creatures' thoughts from righteous actions, just as if they were trapped in well-frozen snow. He projects the thought into people's minds that they should not wear the sacred undershirt and belt, uh, and that final reference is to garments that are obligatory for all adult Zoroastrians to wear. So these passages, in my mind, uh, can be seen as brief vignettes, almost poems even, that paint a portrait of the demon's characters. Though by no means as extensive as the depiction of Vahriman, these demons are portrayed as embodied characters with particular personalities who act in the world in particular ways. 
When we compare the Bundahishan's lush characterization with the Shkan Gumanic Vizar, the difference is striking. Not only do we not find falsehood, the demon of doubt, or almost any other demons for that matter, the Shkan's version of the creation story is similarly spare and depersonalized. As I mentioned, the Shkan refers to creation many times throughout the book, both in the apologetic and in the polemical chapters, but its own retelling of the creation story comes in chapter 4 in the form of a garden parable. And his likeness, this refers to Ormazd, uh, his likeness is like a garden owner and a gardener, who knows that the sinful and harmful vermin and birds wish to destroy the garden by ruining the fruit of the trees. That wise gardener, through little toil of his own, to keep those sinful vermin from the garden, prepared an instrument which could capture the vermin, like a trap, a snare, or a bait for birds, which, when the vermin see the bait, and troubled in desire, approach, unaware of the trap and snare, they're captured inside. It is known that when vermin fall in a trap, or a snare, rather, the victory is not accorded to the snare, but to the snare's maker. By this, the vermin are captured in the trap. The owner of the garden, who made the snare in wisdom, knew the limits and duration of the strength of that vermin. The bodily strength and power of that vermin became powerless and flowed away in struggle. As much as was able, by uprooting the snare and breaking the trap, it struggled to cause ruin. And when, on account of its incomplete strength, the strength for struggle left it and it became powerless, then that wise gardener, through his own desire and his fruit of his own accomplishment, wisely cast that vermin out of the snare, with its strength powerless in its own essence. He consigned his snare and trap, refashioned and undamaged, to the storehouse. So in the solution to the parable, which immediately follows, Mardon Frucht tells us that the gardener is Ormazd, and the vermin, of course, is Achriman. How much more different could the two be? In the Shkan's conception, there is no equivalence between them. Achriman has been transformed into nothing more than a vermin, lacking any depth or any motivation other than hunger. While the Bundahishan's Achriman speaks, and even speaks eloquently, the Shkan's Achriman is dumb and insignificant, dispensed with, with little trouble and less thought. I should add that we need not only read the Shkan's opposition to the divine and demonic anthropomorphism implicitly in this parable. Elsewhere in the book, Mardon Farouk is quite explicit about the irrationality of ascribing human characteristics and motives to supernatural beings. This point is especially underlined in the Shkan's critique of Judaism, in which the Bible's anthropomorphic descriptions of the Jewish God, who the Shkan reveals at the end of that polemic, is actually none other than Achriman himself, are attacked most harshly. Now, I hope I've managed so far to provide, or at least to propose, an answer to the question of why the demon of doubt does not appear in the Shkand. In the time that remains, I want to turn to the related question of how he disappeared in the first place. I believe that, though the two texts approach the issue of demons very differently, they're not unconnected, the Bundeshin contains, in some of its depictions of demons, the seeds of the Shkand's radically depersonified approach. The 35 named demons in chapter 27 of the Bundeshin act on, or attack, different aspects of the created world. Some, such as Chishmag, cause natural disasters and damage to the physical world, right? So there's this reference, Chishmag, uh, and it's not really clear what this name means. Uh, Chishmag causes earthquakes and whirlwinds, opposing the clouds. And there are others, like the demon Decay, uh, who is the demon who causes pollution and putrefaction. Uh, he acts on the human body. However, in addition to similar demons, about half of those mentioned in the list focus their destructive activity on the mind. We've already mentioned Indar, who causes a particular evil idea to enter the brain, but the chapter also refers to Akoman, uh, whose name in fact means evil thought. Evil thought's duty is to give creatures bad thoughts and discord. Uh, we find the reference to Nanheis, the demon Nanheis's duty is to bring creatures unhappiness. There's also Taromad, who causes perverse thoughts. And Akatash, the demon of denial. Wait. I forgot that one. Uh, there's also Akatash, the demon of denial, who causes the creatures, creatures to deny righteousness. And there are others as well. 
Even Ahriman himself is depicted in the chapter as focusing his destruction on the mind. He converts people to love him and to hate Ormazd by sorcery and superstition, so that they abandon the den of Ormazd and practice that of Ahriman. He projects into people's minds, this is not truly the den of Ormazd, you must not believe in it. As his final passage states, these and other mental demons, as we might call them, implant certain evil ideas in our minds. They are responsible for attacking the internal world of the imagination, making us, seemingly against our will and natural inclination, think and hold beliefs that are contrary to the revealed truth of Zoroastrianism. What does it mean when the demon, falsehood, is responsible for implanting doubt in one's mind? If the demon's principal activity, at least in these particular passages, is limited to the realm of thought and the imagination, it seems to me that it's not a very large leap to conclude that the demons themselves are imaginary. All that it is required, really, is reversing the direction of cause and effect, rather than it being the demon who causes a thought in the mind. Both the thought and the demon can be seen as being caused by the mind itself. If the demonic realm of activity exists within the circumscribed confines of the mental world, Perhaps the demons themselves only really exist there, as the products of the mind rather than as actors on it. Now, the Bundahishan doesn't state this idea explicitly or even imply that the mental demons tend to or point in the direction of non-existence. Considered within the larger context of the book as a whole, falsehood, Van Heis, Taromad, etc., uh, are just as real as any plant, tree, animal, or good spirit, uh, which the text also talks about in great detail. But Mardon Farouk, author, author of the Shkan Gumanik Vizar, was a close reader. That much is evident from his own work. I wonder if he did not see other meanings in such passages, or perhaps in similar descriptions of demons in alternate versions of the Bundeshin that have not come down to us. Inasmuch as the project of the Shkan as a whole is reestablishing Zoroastrian theology on a firm rational basis, without the many personified and fully characterized demons that populate Zoroastrian myth in the Bundeshin and elsewhere, the passages that describe demons' activity as limited to the realm of the mind may have served Mardon Farouk as particularly useful and congenial. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam. Um, if there are any questions or comments, uh, Nico. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Sam. Very fascinating, fascinating lecture. <laughs> Two questions. The first one is, is a philological. Uh, when uh, you translated vermin, it's a craft star? Yes. Okay, that's good. No, that's which, is, which is a technical way of speaking. Yeah, thank which you. Is a, craft star is a uh, technical term in Middle Persian for, uh, for evil animals and evil created creatures like wolves or, uh, or there's little like crawly spiders, that kind of thing are all craft star. The second question, you know very well that uh, last, uh, I think he published, Antonio Panaino published a few years ago two articles about uh, the uh, psychological aspect of demons in uh, Zoroastrian religion. What do you think about, I mean, uh, Taromad, the, the, the demon uh, provoking uh, bad thoughts and stuff like this. What do you think about this, uh, this idea to to make a relation between demons, a real pathological, uh, psychological uh, uh, problems? Well, I, um, I think it, it relates to the question that came up yesterday uh, after Kitty Bohak's talk, right? I mean, I wouldn't presume to understand uh, or speculate about the psychology of the people who passed on these traditions in the Bodhishan, uh, about what that might, you know, reveal about their own internal mental life, but I think culturally and theologically there's a point to be made here uh, about the difference between depicting demons as personified anthropomorphic characters and depicting them uh, not in that way, as sort of theologi theological abstractions. And I should say, since Nico asked the question, that uh, all the passages from the Bundeshin are taken from a translation of the book that he and I are working on and hope to publish very soon. Hopefully, Hopefully inshallah. As we say. Any other comments, questions? Daniel.
Yeah, it's uh, just a question. Uh, I, I am not an expert in uh, in Iranian thought, but I wonder what is the relation between the different demons causing evil and Ahriman. Mm -hmm. Are these demons manifestations of Ahriman? Are they helpers of Ahriman? Or is there any theory in uh, in the, these texts about the relations of all these demons with the principle of the uh, of evil. Right. Uh, so there is. The Bundeshin goes into uh, quite a lot of detail about how demons are are fabricated by Ahriman, you might say, because in Zoroastrianism in general, there's a, the there's a theory that everything we can say about Ormazd, like that he's good and present and the creator, etc the opposite of true is true of Ahriman. So if Ormazd creates actively, Ahriman fabricates. It's unclear exactly what that means and how that fabrication, non-creation happens, but uh, the Bundeshin does describe how demons are created in, in order of rank, basically, and uh, beginning with Akoman, uh, evil thought, who's the first demon created, and then through their minions and kind of minions, minions, uh, not it isn't explicated fully, but there's definitely a, a description of the creative process. So on. Okay. In terms of the demons that you're mentioning, <clears throat> excuse me, do any have personalities or attributes beyond maybe being representations of evil thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I don't know if I can find it right here, but I mean, Akraman himself is certainly represented as having a personality, having an emotional life. Uh, when he hears that, when he, it's revealed to him that uh, his agreement with Ormaz, that they're just going to fight for this specific period of time and in this specific creative world, he has, I mean, he, he faints because he's overwhelmed by how terrible that is for him. And, and it, there's a uh, description of how the demons have to gather around him and convince him to get up again, and he's depressed, he doesn't want to. I mean, so in terms of Ahriman, we really do get a picture of a, a character with whom we can identify uh, and who has a complete personality. The other demons, less so, and, and the, the more that a demon is present in the text, the more insight we get into that character's internal life. Um, but uh, yeah, but I do think that they are, are given personalities. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sam.